probably wondering how a government attorney ended up speaking to a group of scientists like you and the National Marine Fisheries Service and said, hey, Millie, how'd you like to do a study for us? We think it's important now to do uh, an analysis five years into the recovery plan about how's it going. And I said to her, well, you know, that's kind of a big undertaking, and it's just me. Um, and I would probably need the Science Center to help and tell me about, you know, not only how are we implementing it, but what's the effect it's having on the ground. Um, there wasn't money for that, and with a measly $23,000, uh, we did a year-long study, and I went out to every uh, watershed, all 14 watersheds of Puget Sound, and spoke with the people on the ground to see how was it going. So today is really marks the first time that I've spoken publicly about a report. Um, I call it the little report that could have because I assumed this was just a, an analysis internal for NOAA to give them an idea of like where do they need the resources and, and how it would go. Uh, but it's proven, as you heard a minute ago, to be something quite more than that, which was a recovery. Uh, but we asked two questions. Are we implementing the plan according to the way the, the, the plan was written? Are we following the strategies we put in place? Uh, and I think we can say from a qualitative standpoint, yeah, most people are still working with the strategies they wrote, and they're trying their best to implement them. And new strategies are being written and, and talked about every day as more science is, and more experience happens. Uh, and we need a way to document that, and there is no real method for, uh, available right now to do that. The second question we asked was, are we on pace to achieve the 10-year goals? This is a 10-year plan, and we were looking at it at year five, knowing that a lot of, you know, ramp up had to happen to get this thing moving, and I think the answer to that, and I'm gonna talk more about little questions um, a little bit more, but the answer was absolutely not. Um, so, so what did we find? Well, I went out, the method of, of doing this work was I went out to every single watershed and went through uh, the written plan, did a nice chart, and started going down and asking people specifically how about the strategy? Who's working on it? What have you done? You know, checking yes, no, what do they need? Um, is it integrated with the rest of their strategies? Do they have enough funding? Um, what kinds of projects are they doing to implement it? And it was an exhaustive project. Um, I also then took a look at what else was in the plan, which is we had these watershed-specific uh, strategies, but we also had regional strategies. And those were the things that the region as a whole was going to get together and negotiate and work on. And that was probably one of the largest gaps that I found. Uh, but I'll talk about that more in a minute. The successes that I found were numerous. I mean, that's the good news here. Um, in terms of harvest management, the co-managers have consistently met and exceeded the requirements of their 2004 plan. And that was um, very hard to see. A lot of hard work going on there. It's not perfect. We need a better ways to predict the pre-season forecast. Um, there's, we're going to have to be developing more tools around it, and I'm sure you all know a lot more about that than I do, um, but that was a great story of success. Um, in terms of hatchery management, at the time that I wrote the report, um, the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife had just completed their 21st century um, Salmon and Steelhead Initiative, which was a strategic planning effort, as I call it, um, that would help them identify, monitor, and evaluate long-term hatchery management strategies for the future. So that was going to be their guide for how they were going to come up with their strategies for all of the hatcheries around that they manage and control. Uh, severely underfunded uh, in terms of that their work, they need more um, support in that regard, uh, but still that piece of planning work is huge in guiding them to the future. In terms of habitat restoration around the, the 14 watersheds, there are tons of projects that have been done, uh, lots of good successes happening there. Probably Habitat is still declining across every measure that I saw in that report. To just highlight a few, forest cover and habitat complexity continues to decline. We know from experience that where land development happens, habitat declines. I mean, that's just the way it's been going. Uh, from 2001 until 2006, development across Puget Sound increased by 3%. And that was at the height of the push. Uh, that's a lot. There's a lot of change in land mass um, across one area, one land area. Nearly two thirds of that land was turned into impervious surface. That means the loss of forest cover, um, habitat complexity. You guys know the drill. Uh, what happens? Um, the hydrology of the watersheds have radically changed, uh, and now we're trying.
down to the store then with capital projects. So if we don't get our handle on habitat loss, forest cover in particular, which is sort of the canary in the, in the mine for me, uh, we're not going to get there. Intertidal wetlands was listed as the most threatened kind of habitat in Puget Sound. Um, we've seen two historically major losses, and this isn't just in the last few years, this is going all the way back to the Western Settlement, where the ports have de degraded uh, uh, intertidal wetlands for economic purposes. Uh, in terms of shorelines and near shore, from 2000 to 2006, the Puget Sound shoreline became shorter than it was historically. Our total short form length declined by 15%. And keep in mind now, we have some of the most aggressive shoreline regulations in the nation. And still we're seeing those losses. And it's because those regulations aren't perfect, but I'll talk more about those in a few minutes. Yield grass beds. We saw, if we looked at 2000 to 2008, and there was an overall pattern of more declines in gains. Uh, and so we're still losing that basic area of feeding and foraging um, for salmon as they're moving from the estuaries out into the sound. We need those yield grass beds. So, what else could go on here? I mean, you could, I could continue to talk about the different indicators, but I think you get the point. Um, despite the ESA listing, and despite our state, which do, does really have some of the best regulations in the country for land use and habitat protection, we are still experiencing loss. And funding levels for the salmon recovery program are also inadequate, even to implement the three year short term. Plan called the three work programs. Funding's been increasing steadily, it's been ramping up, and that's good, but we've reached a, a bit of a ceiling. We're only at 31% of the funding we need just to fund those three year plans. It's going to cost us, if we were to implement everything on the list so far, it's a billion dollar project. We've got 30% you know, of that. Most of the watersheds told me they're behind with the pace of implementation because of the lack of funding and the lack of staff. One thing that I found interesting is that each of the funding, the grant funders, they love to fund capital projects. Boots on the ground, shovels in the dirt, things that they can tangibly see. Legislators love that stuff. They don't love funding the people who put their hands on the shovels to do the work. Uh, and that's something I think culturally we're going to have to get our hands around and change. Uh, because without people to do the work, you don't get the capital projects done. A uh, couple things. So I mentioned that we have some of the best regulations around. We have the Growth Management Act. Most states don't have that. Uh, it's, it's a both a blessing and a curse. It required each jurisdiction to draw big circles around its urban areas and say, this is what we're going to keep as urban. Uh, we had to designate rural lands and then natural resource lands. And in the natural resource bucket, we've got forestry, agriculture, and mining. Those are the only three types of lands now that exist from a planning perspective in Puget Sound. So you're either rural, urban, or natural resources. If you're urban, you're required, and I don't mean suburban, I mean urban. The, the GMA is intending folks to become urbanites, not suburbanites. Uh, and so what, what we have happening now is the OFM gives each county planning numbers that they think new population will flow into their jurisdiction. And so what they're supposed to do is see whether or not they've got enough acreage available to house all those people. If they don't, they can move the boundaries out a bit. And it's hard to move the boundaries, they've made it difficult, which is good. Um, or you can go up and uh, add stories and, and, and height on your buildings to let people pack in more population. Well, the problem with the Growth Management Act, um, and I got in trouble for saying this, and I do get in trouble when I say things, um, is that it never stops planning for the growth. It never says enough is enough, too, there's no such a thing as too much. Uh, but we also have no effectiveness monitoring on our habitat regulations. And that's just something that's got to be done. Uh, we have not, been, I mentioned a minute ago that our regional uh, plan strategies, we said we needed to develop strategies across all of Puget Town for habitat protection. That work has not been done. It's hard work. And it takes huge amounts of compromise. And remember when I started at the beginning and said this was about collaboration? And if anybody voices an objection, it stops? Well, that's been part of the problem. Most watershed groups, and including the entire big recovery planning group, is a big tent. And it's built on uh, folks who have different viewpoints, who come from lots of different perspectives. You've got developers there, you've got tribes there, and you have government workers, you've got uh, interested stakeholders. And in many of the watersheds that I talk
talked to said we can't enhance habitat protection on a regulatory front because of the blow of our group and we'll lose all of our supporters for all of them. And so we can't advance that. We need help. We need somebody else to do that for us. And so we need to put pressure on the region to do it if the watersheds themselves find it's just too politically hot to do at the local level. We also don't have an, an adaptive management plan yet, uh, even though we drafted the Lama, the Lama plan. Um, we need to finish that work because if we don't know, if we're, if we're not monitoring and adapting our strategies as we go, uh, we're never going to get there. Lastly, um, there's a couple of other little interesting things that if you weren't a hearing examiner or a land use junkie, you might not know. But within most regulations, there are there's something called mitigation sequencing. And it drives how hard somebody has to work to protect before they're allowed to mitigate. So you've all probably heard about the avoid, minimize, mitigate, restore hierarchy built within regulations. There's absolutely nothing I've yet to see a single regulation that says how hard you have to try to avoid before you get to move to minimize or mitigate. There's nothing that guides that. And so typically what I see as a hearing examiner is the developer comes in and says, well, I don't want to avoid that because I can get three more lots in there and that's the profitability of my project. So I'm not going to avoid years of mitigation and it's routinely accepted as okay. And it's built into the code set. So if we're going to get at that issue and say, no, you're going to try harder, or, or you just have to completely avoid, we've got to rewrite those regulations. Most jurisdictions don't want to touch the critical area regulations, which is where you find those, that sequencing process, uh, because what happens is they get sued uh, over somebody who's unhappy either because it's too restrictive or it's not restrictive enough. Uh, and they spend tens of thousands, if not more, dollars litigating in front of the road manager for the non office uh, and that's very expensive and very politically difficult for local governments to do. They don't want to touch it. So if they don't have to reopen those regulations except every seven years now that we have meant for that, they're not going to do it on their own. We also have this amazing patchwork of regulations across the landscape. You have at least four regulatory federal agencies, four state agencies, if I can think of them, probably more. We have 39 counties, we've got a whole bunch of cities. Every single organization has different regulations and they're applied differently. So if you, you know, take the, a particular watershed, you could have four or five cities in it, you could have a county underlying all that, and you could have federal and state actors as well on permit. It's a lot of people to coordinate. Uh, when I did a report for the Puget Sound Partnership on uh, what we could be doing differently in terms of writing the action agenda for land use strategies. That was the one thing that I pointed out and said, you know, we just have too many fingers in the pot. Um, we need to streamline regulations, but we need to make sure they're consistent from top to bottom. And we don't have that right now. We have a patchwork. And it's hard on the regulators too, because they bump up against, you know, a permit requirement from ecology where it says do something this way, but the local government is saying, no, we wanted you to do it that way. It makes a big impact when people say what really needs to be said. And it's difficult and you're going you know, be criticized at times. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard for people to hear that things aren't perfect. I was told by uh, one policymaker that I couldn't say anything negative about funding because it would all get cut off. And that just people were doing the best they could do. I don't buy that. I really don't buy that. I think you've got to say we need a billion dollars for our three-year work plans and we've got to figure out a way to do it. Even about Democrats, you know, who, who uh, the party supposedly is largely supportive of, of uh, salmon recovery and environmental things, is always fifth on their agenda. You know, it's right in the top five, but it's fifth. So we need to do a better job influencing people who hold the purse strings, influencing elected officials who hold the regulatory strings, uh, and I need your help to do that. We all need your help. Uh, thank you for your time today. I guess do I have time for any questions? I've got a little time for questions if you've got any, but thank you very much for having me here.